Good afternoon, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with a brief Monday, July 27th coronavirus update. Going to just cover a couple things and hopefully some good news. Um, if you haven't uh, watched on Friday, we did post a pretty long question and answer with Dr. Hogan Camp and Dr. Bream and I. We took all the questions that people had asked the previous week and tried to get through a lot of them. There's a long discussion about schools. There's a variety of things that we talked about. If you look in the video description, it has what we talked about and what time in the video. And I think if you actually watch it on YouTube, you can actually skip forward to those sections, I think. Anyway, good information there. And I know a lot of people are really concerned about schools and we talked about it, you know, a, a good good percentage of the hour that we spoke, we talked about schools and kids. So today's update, um, the numbers as usual, uh, I guess before that, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Galvin. I'm an emergency physician, functional medicine physician in Charlotte. I've been posting videos about the virus since it started, and we also um, are doing uh, other things to try to get people healthy. Uh, but today we're gonna be talking about coronavirus. We usually start with the numbers, 16.3 million cases worldwide, 650,000 deaths, 4.3 million cases here in the United States, 150,000 deaths, and in my state of North Carolina, 114,000 cases, uh, 1,790 deaths. Now, I mentioned some good news. Now, I think if you remember from a couple weeks ago when the mask mandate came out, and I believe um, here the masks were mandated on the 26th of June, I sort of said that if we're gonna see results from the mask, it's gonna probably take three to six weeks. And you know, we're not the only place that's mandated masks and, and you know, there've been big outbreaks, especially in Texas and Florida and California and Arizona. And so what's interesting as I've been watching the numbers in North Carolina is that over the last week or so, we've seen our case positivity result drop. Um, we were running about 10% of the case, of the tests that we were doing were coming back positive, and now we're down to 8%, and that number's been sort of steadily you know, dropping down. So it looks like in North Carolina, at least, we may have hit a little bit of, of a, a plateau and heading down, and that kind of times right when we started, you know, correctly for when we started, you know, implementing those mask mandates, and that may be having its effect now. And that's what we saw in Europe is once they kind of locked down to the mask, the numbers dropped off the cliff, which is what we're hoping to find here. Worldwide, um, the, or, I'm sorry, nationwide, the case positivity results has been about not between about March 1st and July 11th, I think is average to be about around 10% or so. But interestingly, since July 12th, so the last day we have like full information is July 12th through July 18th, it was down to 8.6%. And we're starting to see numbers starting to, to plateau and drop um, in terms of the seven day moving average in Florida and Arizona and Texas, which are the, you know, the biggest hotspots in the country. The hospitalizations lag the, the cases. So you get sick, you know, you stay home for a while and, and that subset that gets sicker ends up in the hospital, but it lags being actually coming down to, with the virus. You don't like get the virus and get admitted to the hospital. You know, you get the virus, a week later you get sick, and then after, you know, three to five days, you may get sicker still and then end up in the hospital. And so that's sort of, those hospitalization numbers are going to lag. And so really the, the numbers to watch are positive cases and, and percent positive cases to sort of figure out if this mask and, and social distancing is actually doing what it's supposed to do. The other interesting thing I, I found was a study out of King's College in London that actually looked and said, hey, listen, we think there may be different presentations of COVID and they've, they've kind of narrowed it down to six different um, you know, types of COVID. Now remember, COVID is the disease SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes the disease. So the coronavirus causes the disease. The disease itself is COVID. And what they've designed, what they've just, you know, postulated is that there are six types of COVID. And they range from like very mild flu-like symptoms with, you know, no fever, all the way up to, you know, severe symptoms of respiratory compromise and everything else. But interestingly, there are three forms of it that are felt to be pretty mild. Flu-like symptoms with out fever, flu-like symptoms with fever, and also sort of primary GI symptoms. So a little bit of flu-like symptoms, but with diarrhea or nausea or things like that. Um, and that's interesting. Then, then it goes beyond that. It, it adds some things like more severe GI symptoms, uh, confusion, 
fatigue and shortness of breath. And so those ones that have all of those characteristics tend to, to devolve into the more serious forms and also seem to predominate among people who are at risk. So older people, people with underlying medical problems. And so that's an interesting thing because it may help us as physicians delineate who we need to be worried about and maybe who we don't need to be worried about. Most of those different types of COVID were, you know, had sort of the classic, you know, cough, uh, loss of taste and smell in a lot of those cases. And that seemed to be sort of universal. And that's the first time I've seen anybody actually try to, you know, say, hey, maybe there's different, we know that there are some people that get it bad and some people that don't get it that badly. And now someone has actually made a, a kind of quantitative measurement. And so if we, if that proves to be valid, it may be a tool that we can use as physicians to sort of say, okay, you've got these symptoms, then you're in this risk stratification that's of low risk because these are the symptoms you have, and we're going to you know, follow you a little bit differently. Uh, I did post on the page today that Moderna is starting phase three trials. They've had, the, you know, phase three is the, the, the vaccine part of the trial that you actually see if it works and if it's safe and you use a lot of people. So the first phase is just maybe 10, 20 people. I think phase two is maybe 40 to 60 people. Phase three is 30,000 people, and they've had 150,000 people volunteer to be subjects in these tests. There are These are randomly controlled tests, meaning that you don't know whether you get the vaccine or a placebo, and they're going to, um, the, the Moderna one actually requires two doses. They're gonna get those doses, and then they're gonna follow people for you know side effects and safety issues but also to see if the people that got the vaccine actually got the, the, the real vaccine don't get COVID. And that will take some time. I don't know how long you're going to have to, you know, to, to enroll all 30,000 people. But I mean, generally, these things take years and years and we are rushing everything and getting it done in months. But the interesting thing is we should probably have some data, you know, within a couple months to give us an idea. Now, remember, there right now there are four different um, vaccines that are, are going into phase three, and there's about 100 plus more that are working their way through phases one and two. So we don't know which one of these vaccines is going to be the one or if there's going to be multiple ones. But of the ones that are in phase three trials, this month they're going to do Moderna. I think next month they're going to do one for Johnson & Johnson. The month after that, I think it's November. Novavax and oh I know actually Oxford the Oxford University one is going to be next next month then Johnson and Johnson and then Novavax and so each one of those will have sort of the same study done in the U.S. with thirty thousand people and a placebo controlled randomly controlled trial so the investigators won't know who gets what they won't know whether they've got placebo and they won't know whether they got the real thing and that data will get crunched and so you know hopefully we'll have some some good news from the vaccines as time goes on. But again, they need to be safe. They need to be effective. And we won't know that until we get through more of these trials and, and, and try it on a lot of people. But luckily, we've had 150 of our fellow citizens who have volunteered to be uh, subjects for this and, you know, essentially guinea pigs. And with their uh, willingness to help us all out, we'll probably get some answers a lot faster than we would normally. So that's the update for today. As usual, please follow me on, on Facebook. Uh, follow or rather subscribe to us on Facebook. Uh, uh, take the, scratch that. I'm a little confused. It's Monday. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. We are going to be posting uh, more Wellness Wednesday content. We're actually going to talk about fitness testing this week. And then I think next week we're going to do uh, early detection and analysis of cardiovascular disease, especially how to screen young people for sudden cardiac death, which is a big killer in the U.S., and we've you know probably all know somebody who's dropped dead suddenly in their in, in their late 30s or early 40s or, or 50s uh, and didn't have any medical problems, but their first presentation was that they died. And there's some ways of discovering that and and identifying those people who are at risk early on and doing things to prevent it. As usual, wear your mask, wash your hands responsibly socially distanced, take care of yourselves, take care of your families, take care of those around you, and I will talk to you soon. Have a great day.